You just move five feet and open a locker. Later, when you're killing skyscraper-sized monsters with a gun that shoots a lightning, you look back on this moment and be like, Heh. No. No, I don't think I will. Let me introduce you to the only gun that you need to beat Borderlands 2. Basic repeater. Starter pistol. Starting pistol. Whatever you call it, this thing is certainly one of the guns of all time. Boasting 11 damage per round, an accuracy that looks a lot higher than it is, and coming from a terrible manufacturer. If you like burst fire weapons, that's okay. You're allowed to be wrong. This one in particular fires two rounds. Who would want that? Why would anyone want that? Sure, you can fire single bullets by not aiming, but it fires one bullet per trigger pull. And this is going to require a lot of trigger pulls. The wiki says that it should be replaced as soon as better weapons are available. Instead, I'm both asking and answering the question of whether or not this infamous little gun can beat every challenge Pandora has to offer. And by every challenge, I mean the campaign. I'm not doing the DLC. Or side quests. For legal purposes, it is a unique weapon. It's uniquely worse with a lowered magazine capacity. It is the only piece of unique gear that I will be using. Obviously no bar. I won't be using any offensive shields of any kind. I won't be dealing damage through any other means. No vehicles, melee, grenades, or bouncing on enemies. I don't even aim for things like barrels. If they went off because an enemy hit them, that's their own fault. Importantly though, I will not be using my action skill at any point. Gunzerking requires two guns, and I have one. And yes, holding a second gun counts as using another weapon. Should I ever accidentally do any of the above, I'll be resetting the area via save quit. I chose Salvador because he regenerates bullets via class mod. Because I'm genuinely horrified by how much ammo became necessary for every inch of progress I made. Here's my final build for the run, feel free to make fun of it in the comments. Here's my gear. I slowly accumulated a lot over time figuring out when to use different things, and all I'm gonna say is that Wham Bam Island is great for getting relics, never really tried before this run, and it is very nice. What you're seeing at the moment is of course the gun's intended use. It's so intended that they added multiple different guns to the game to replace it before you even start. When playing casually, I tend to just avoid this thing in general. Either way, I usually pick up the first Jacob's gun from Knuckle Dragger and never look back. This concludes the portion of the game that I believe this gun should ever even maybe be used. And that's only on the base patch. Unfortunately, the game carries on, and I had to clear out Liarsburg. Dealing with bandits that have smaller heads and move around a lot more weren't enough to deter me, but I think Claptrap misheard because he took a detour before getting knocked out. After he got back up on his wheel, we set off to deal with literally the first encounter outside of the tutorial. Now, this gun may be incredibly inaccurate, but headshots are already a must. My survivability is fine, but I need to be in melee range to shoot accurately, and my attacks are doing less damage than melee. I've also got limited ammo to contend with, which is great. This would pretty immediately be an issue, as the very next boss is resistant to bullets. I left to the peak to farm XP, which you can do by baiting skags into their untimely demise. If this is too close to doing fall damage for you, then I could farm fight for sanctuary instead, but this is faster. I've got other things I gotta do. At some point, I really should just start using something like a save editor for XP farming. This takes so long, and it really doesn't make a difference, but I don't know. After coming back with enough skill points to gain a mild damage buff that didn't actually add any damage, but at least a high enough level to beat the level difference debuff, I still didn't have enough. I tried using the game's method of prioritizing ammo that you have very little of to my advantage. Figured I could kill psychos as walking ammo containers, and it didn't not work. It cost enough bullets though that any one of them that dropped nothing meant I was screwed. Luckily the ammo containers were a bit more generous and I was able to end out with a genuinely healthy amount of bullets. Funny how that works. Luckily I wasn't completely out of second wins, but they fell off. So fast. Luckily Flint has two major weaknesses. Multiple cheese options and a lot of bullets. Incredibly cheap bullets. Honestly I had a harder time dealing with the mobs that came after he died. They have less health, but they move more, and they're smaller targets, because sizes of target has a lot to do with the difficulty of using this gun. I was able to easily snag a free car, because it doesn't require combat, and I drove it to meet the Crimson Raiders. They became combative in my attempts to join them with my trusty sidearm, but luckily it wasn't the kind that required shooting, because I don't trust my sidearm. I did have to try to rescue some guy I never met who seemed to be in a tough situation. Three bandits by yourself at once, and one of them is a badass. Even at this level, it's basically a raid boss, so I can see why he died. Luckily for me, I knew that I could just piss off some Bullymong and have them do it for me. I mean, the Bullymong interrupted my courageous efforts and stole the glory of rescuing such a distinguished Crimson Raider that was so influential that he was never brought up again. I got excited for a moment seeing the last remaining enemy be thrown off a cliff, but it was short-lived joy as he had the audacity to survive. Just to set the tone for events to come, I definitely didn't accidentally fall and have to go all the way back around to find Reese dead. I couldn't remember what to look for with who had what, so I shot my way through the bloodshot camp killing countless enemies to get the goods that I needed to help Sanctuary. Unless you can count to two, because that's how many I killed. 
Jessup finally managed to jess up with the situation and open the door genuinely quickly. Which seems suspicious. What the hell is this run gonna do to me? After seeing a neat trick online, I did the only natural thing and tried to replicate it, proving that Salvador's midichlorians are indeed off the scale and he might fulfill that prophecy. Well, the raiders were impressed, of course. Could I stop Jack and cut off the source? They wanted help, insisted. Other guns I forbid, because... I, I don't I don't know, I thought this would be fun. It started off that way. It didn't end that way. This was a mistake. But there's no time to consider that now. We lost a person. Like, literally lost him. So I left to see his not-girlfriend. And I get they're in wartime and priorities and all, but Roland is kind of married to conflict. He's never going to be able to handle living a normal life, and the guy honestly really needs therapy. As someone that loves him, she should really support him going through something of the sort to get him on the road to recovery. For this section, I decided to go with the age-old strategy of letting her handle it because I couldn't be bothered. True story, I left the game and recording running during this part, left the room entirely, and went to reheat chicken nuggets that I was given previously. When I got back, she was still going, so I was able to eat in comfort. Beautiful, still progressing the game comfort. Unfortunately for me, I made that executive decision far too late, and Lilith managed to kill everything before I could finish eating. Now what, am I supposed to let my food get cold or play with greasy fingers? Both options are terrible, so my play was fairly hindered for a short bit. Also, this is a reminder to clean your mouse pad, keyboard, mouse, and or controller. Hands get gross. Lilith thinks she might know where he is, but he has done literally nothing to go try to save him. Kinda makes me wonder what she's been doing the whole time. I managed a perfect 10 landing on my vehicle in a way that I've never seen because the game will never cease to find new ways to break on me. I need to get into a stronghold, and to do so, I need to get a car. To do that, I need to break some cars. And to do that, I need a lot of bullets. Luckily, my access to Sanctuary has afforded me a lot of ammo capacity, but I'm gonna level with you. That didn't make as big a difference as one might hope. My only real strategy for getting the needed parts was to wait for the cars to get themselves stuck, and then pump a few, okay, maybe more than a few hundred bullets into them from the safety of not being able to be hit. Gotta love the cover in this game. A lot of these runs would be impossible if it wasn't this janky. I leveled up some more to solve my problems and started up a Headhunter DLC to do some vendor farming and attempt to get a Horticross mod. For those that don't know, the Horticross mod gives you passive bullet regen, which is required for this run. Because I ain't gun zerking, and you can't make me. This game gives you one starter pistol, and I'm using one starter pistol. Then came a lot of shooting of cars. Sometimes more productive than others. I don't know why I hadn't considered that the car part would be outside of where I could reach, thus making all of those shots wasted. But really, waiting for these cars to get stuck is not only viable, but extremely common. It's like they're not even licensed to operate. Oh. Uh, you know, now that I think about it, I got a beautifully sparkly car and headed out to fight Badma. Fact remained that I wasn't making use of barrels for the run, and that was honestly the only thing that I could think of to sort of give me an edge up here. Or that and the fact that I know you can hide up here to get good cover without the possibility of being flanked. What followed was a rain of bullets. I tried breaking the chains of the shield. I spent a pretty long while just shooting. And the thing that I discovered with all shield-wielding nomads is that there really isn't much of a difference between hitting them and hitting their shield. What's it gonna do? Reduce my damage output? The hell is it reducing? Not even Money Shot makes these numbers look impressive. After Bad Ma had a Bad Ma slowly bored into him over the course of countless rounds, I made my way into the Bloodshot Stronghold. This place is infamous, and with good reason. This isn't it, but the reason behind it is good. You've got poor cover, a lot of enemies, and a pretty steep difficulty hike in your first outing. In this case, you could more or less put the Invincible after every enemy's name, because I've seen raid bosses taken down faster than these random mobs. For more difficult encounters, there's a certain draw to just staying back and firing. I can't hit things often, but I'll get them eventually. I managed to find Roland, but he didn't have any idea where he was going either, got a taxi elsewhere, and he felt so awkward about it that he decided to go with the driver instead of just cancelling. Now he's once again my problem, after having been my problem for the last few missions. When it came to fighting the driver to take Roland back home, though, I don't think it'd be a surprise to anyone to say that the damage on Warden isn't good. Isn't even remotely good. Some might even say bad. That's me. I'm that some. For those that don't know, if you don't kill this thing fast enough, you get sent to the gulag. Same fight, but considerably harder. I had to leave to farm out some survivability. On my way back through Bloodshot, I had to restart multiple times due to accidental bounces, but I made my way back to the Warden, and it really didn't go any better. Am I overleveled? Absolutely. Is this still doing horrible damage? Also absolutely. Is that ever going to change? Not a chance. So when brute force fails you, work smarter. I needed to do a lot of damage. I needed to do it consistently. And I needed to survive. I would take care of all of the above with the same simple trick. By hiding behind an old car, which somehow also protects you from exploders, and shoot it in the eye until Roland is free. 
Against all odds, the Warden can be killed before the Gulag with only the starter pistol. If this run were to die here and now, I'd call that a win. Any day of the week, I'd call that a win that I can live with. But oh, the run would not die here. I let Rowan handle a bunch of the loaders because I was just relaxing after somehow passing something that I legitimately thought was impossible. I returned home so we wouldn't get lost again and left to get, get the gang back together. I had a weirdly hard time baiting Varkids into burning themselves, but eventually got through that little mess without attacking anything. Doing some explosives for Tina was easy, and is almost universally easy. The fact that I'm overleveled means it's even easier, because it just involves running, then completely evading the aggro range of all nearby enemies setting up some explosives, and for legal purposes, I thought they were just stuffed animals. So if you could just do me a favor and not rewind the video by a few seconds. The resulting fallout of my actions would be a fight that I had been dreading since before I even started this mess. Warden is a pain with the potential to regenerate its shields. Wilhelm is a guarantee. I can sort of break the shield surveyors, but not quickly enough to matter. And if it isn't apparent, I can't outdamage what they give him. I sort of just struggled against him, flailing my useless limbs around in a futile struggle to find anything that could be done. He's not generally a hard fight. For when he is, he can be easily cheesed by sitting next to the fast travel. Except sometimes his health will reset if you sit there, but not consistently. And I couldn't deal with the loaders nearby. It wasn't just that I couldn't break them. I couldn't break their shields. And the shield surveyors fixed them up so quickly that I couldn't break the shield surveyors' shields while their reflector shields were down either. It was as though every part of this place was acting as a well-oiled machine, every gear spinning perfectly in sync with its counterparts. It was... hopeless. Except it wasn't. I've beaten Wilhelm under some absolutely awful rules. I've had to fight him in ways that very few people have even considered. And through the information I have painstakingly gathered from this game, I was able to come up with this. At this location on the map, the loaders could hardly touch me. Wilhelm would knock them away before they could hit me. He was locked into the same spitting animation because I was just so close. So hittable. But not at all. I was slightly too low for him to reach because the object I hid behind blocked the line of sight of his AoE. But that wouldn't be enough. It couldn't be. I had found the perfect cheat spot to deal damage. So carefully placed in the middle of the battlefield. I paired it nicely like a fine cheese with... Bread? Or something? I, I, I don't know. I can't eat cheese, I don't know what it pairs with. But regardless, when Wilhelm surveyors are repairing his shield, they'll sometimes get locked into a state where they both are and aren't giving him shield. They can't restart because he won't move away. They won't either because he of course needs them. This means any amount of damage is enough to kill him. He won't spawn in more surveyors because he has a spawn limit that he's filled with useless shield drones. The fool. Now he will... well, that's unfortunate. I can't deal enough damage to the loaders to deal with them in a timely fashion. I feared they might simply be saved by the surveyors, canceling the glitch I'd been graced with. I found myself shoved around constantly, unable to get back into my little spot of safety. So quickly, everything just fell to pieces. But seriously, this is an amazing spot for a boss that only really needs to be cheesed by a tiny fraction of the player base. But with no way to handle the loaders, I would need another way. I elected to stay back here, a spot that protects you from pretty much everything. Somehow. I swear I had grenades and whatnot from him hitting me, and it just didn't matter. It was still within his aggro range, so he wouldn't just up and leave like he would at the fast travel spot. If he did such a thing, he'd be able to get his shield back, but this was remarkably safe. For a time. And then it happened. I almost died. But if what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, then I present to you the third cheesy spot that I found for fighting Wilhelm in just this run. Once again, I was taking direct hits from his attacks and not taking any damage. Setting up the shield glitch was as easy as just shooting him until it worked. Or stopped working, I guess. I ran out of ammo, sure, but that just made money shot more effective. I was able to easily line up crits on the big guy. He got so frustrated that he knocked his own loader friend off the map. Rest in pieces, bozo. He did have one attack that could still actually hit me, and to be fair, it did a lot of damage. But it's really easy to avoid, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but Wilhelm was genuinely easy. Super long, and tedious, but easy. If you wind it up right, you can even jump back onto the main platform. Unfortunately for me though, it was he who would have the last laugh. He threw the power core I was after into the void, and I had no way to retrieve it. I would have to face him alive and well once more. But in exchange for bringing him back to life, he gave me the core for free, and I left, because if I don't have to do that again, I ain't gonna. I brought it to its resting point, where I suppose they'd never get another shield again, because they got blasted. And two things. Lilith is able to take this amount of Iridium and teleport the entire city. Five chunks. Keeping in mind that I've given hundreds of bars to Earl, she took that and teleported the entire location somewhere else. Why the hell doesn't she just teleport Jack a few thousand feet off the surface of whatever planet and call it a day? Or evaporate Wilhelm with her mind? 
Or maybe send a Hyperion outpost or three into a volcano. Just why is she so canonically powerful, but also damn near irrelevant to anything that's happening? She could single-handedly end this war and doesn't. Also, Scooter managed to keep this whole city in the air with a machine that he said wasn't ready to fly, which means two things. Scooter is an incredible engineer and was able to make a bunch of junk float. And also Scooter is humble enough, cares enough about the health and safety of the citizens that he didn't want to go through with the flight even as a last resort. Please ignore that it was to save his own life as well, and that the fatality rate in his cars is staggering. I got through the fridge in what was definitely my first try with little effort. Not sure why I have this spare footage lying around of some idiot dying on my computer. Man, what a loser. I headed toward Overlook before remembering to grab the fast travel station, grabbed the fast travel station, skipped a bridge section. Thank you, Mick! And began an epic battle with a gluttonous thresher. Realistically, I was slowly tickling it trying to prevent shield regeneration while the loaders took care of it, but I was here for moral support. And without moral support, the robotic kill squad probably would have been fine. So I provided myself with moral support and called myself an important member of the team. You can't see it, but I gave myself a gold star. A hypothetical one due to budget cuts, but I carry it with me in spirit. I took the beacon instead of the star that I earned according to myself and headed to Overlook. I went back and forth with how I wanted to handle the defense portion. Realistically speaking, you can skip it, but you can also sort of just wait it out. This place is inconsequential. I thought about pretending to try here, but I don't think it was very convincing. Even when I threw some bullets into the mix, it just wasn't really cutting it anymore. So, I went to buy a new gun. To feed directly into the grinder, which is right where you're going next if you don't want to shape up, you useless hunk of metal. Welcome to the preserve. Let's not all pretend we don't know exactly where this is going. This place is barely passable in a casual playthrough. I very slowly whittled down the health of the gun loaders to get a door open. For the few people that are left that don't know, the wound loader objective is health-based, not limb-based. I ran through everything that I could because I hate this place and I made my way to a mandatory encounter that I wasn't dreading even nearly enough. I let the loaders handle the stalkers because there wasn't any world in which this fight was ever going to go differently. After which time though, I had a bunch of loaders and only a broken nerf gun to my name. I decided that my time would be better spent elsewhere, so I came back with some more levels for the sake of survivability. During which time, I was greeted by this excited fellow. I slowly cleared out the other loaders, which was a nightmare, but it made this walking hell spawn a bit more tolerable. I also found that the far left of the arena was a bit more workable than my typical hiding spot. With proper placement, it can even work for a perfect cover. If nothing else, it gives more options. Regardless, I was using a really nice TDR shield, and it let me basically just face tank the loader's attacks, so I could focus on pumping it full of whatever you want to call this, because it, it's not damage. At least that mess is over, and I can move on to... Oh, yeah, there's another mandatory fight here. Fine, how bad can the skags be? The answer is very. They're constantly in your face, constantly knocking you around, and what are you going to do about it? Shoot them? Going to take approximately all of your ammo and they won't sit still. I did find that their AI would bug out on the upper platform of the area. If they followed you and you left, they'd sometimes just sit still for a long while. Which also works out because it's one of the only spots Mordecai can hit these things. Good to know for when I can't hurt or slag them in the future. Of course, that wouldn't be the worst thing to happen in this cursed place. That honor would of course go to Bloodwing. She's fast and my bullets are not. Luckily, she isn't the tankiest of girls, and so it could have been going worse. It only took about 16 minutes to get her into her second phase, where I had to restart. And by restart, according to the rules, I had to save quit, which meant rerunning the whole map, which took about an hour. The bright side is that I found out that you can bait the skags to chase you backwards, giving you a perfect cheese spot for normal enemies. What has become of me? I lured the skags up to the respawn station to keep them out of the arena so I wouldn't risk bouncing on them. For some reason, they don't come back down. Frankly, I was already fed up with this bird. I didn't have a good way to prevent her from doing it all over again, except for one strat. One cursed strategy that I never thought I'd have to use. Jumping continuously without stopping breaks a lot of AIs, but none that I'm aware of more than Bloodwing. It's not a new bug, by any means. I didn't discover it. But as I don't have a name to put to it, today I humbly submit to the community the name Blood Pumping. It'll more or less lock her into whatever she was doing when you started. If she was standing, she'll stand. And that's kind of it. If she's flying in place, well, she really isn't going anywhere. She can sometimes break out for a few moments, but she's so genuinely easy to walk down. Her head is big enough and she doesn't move much at all, so chaining headshots is easy even for me and my aim. You want to see her moonwalk? This is how you see her moonwalk. If you can keep jumping for as long as the fight takes, well, this really isn't hard. At all. You can use it in moderation to easily avoid any of her attacks, or you can blood pump your way to a boss that won't dodge or fight back in any meaningful way. With this strategy, she's genuinely one of the easiest bosses in the game, if you're willing to put in the time to jump. 
which for the record, with the starting pistol, it was about 12 minutes. After successfully saving Bloodwing via a lot of bullets, really, how did you think that was going to work out? I went home to try to high-five Claptrap with bullets. It went just as well as you might have expected. Except you can just kind of keep shooting, which he of course shrugs off. Somehow. Why is he not still a Vault Hunter again? Ah, oh, right, yeah, I'm doing about as much damage as a warm blanket on a cold night. In spite of that, I was being trusted to escort a message to Brick to get him to join up with our efforts. Fun fact, Goliath's helmets and Chains on Nomad's shields have a sort of hidden health bar. You have to deplete it before removing either. Or at least, that's my theory. I don't have the code in front of me to prove it, but it took a ton of shots to do anything. Once the Goliath went around killing things through no fault of my own, I'm sure, I was of course faced with the question of what I'd do with the big guy. There is of course a corner of the arena which I could hide in, but he's got a ton of health to contend with. Well, easy answer. I'd simply have him jump in such a way that he'd clip into brick and stop moving entirely so I could consistently crit him to death without having to worry about silly things like aiming. This was definitely intentional and not at all a happy little accident. I swear though, it feels like there's just always a new way for this game to break on me. Afterwards, Brick, being the gentleman that he is, treated me to a lovely time of sitting around and letting him handle combat. If I'm being entirely honest, I do enjoy these runs. They can sometimes be painful, but I wouldn't be doing them if they weren't fun at all. That being said, there's something special about having the ability to just kick back and relax while still making progress. Let's face it, if I continued to actually try, I'd speed this up by maybe a few seconds at the most. Of course, right after would be agony. I spent a while. A really long while trying to figure out how to handle Jack's body double. He's most vulnerable when his AI stops working. That tends to happen after his shield breaks for the first time when he's able to run away and back. So I tried a lot of things to break his seemingly invulnerable shield. The problem was that he has a ton of enemies around him fully capable of shredding through what health I have. And as nice as my healing was, it wasn't enough to keep up. And as much as I could keep my distance, I'm pretty sure that this thing couldn't even accurately hit something that was lodged in the barrel. I ended up getting lucky enough to have him tail me to some cover with his allies a relatively good distance away, and you're seeing what it's doing with almost exclusively crits. I thought I had him here for a pretty solid bit, even in spite of the enemies around me, but he started moving again, ran away, and I had to do things the hard way. By which I mean I very slowly whittled down his health from up here. And even in the successful attempt to kill him, it just... I hate this fight. Even on a good day, I'm just not happy to see him. Till next time, you dead bastard! I collected Claptrap for everyone's favorite mission, if you ignore all of the other missions, and made my way to Thousand Cuts. The first hurdle would of course be getting by all of the enemies, which will eventually be difficult, I'm sure. The constructor is easier to handle when facing the wrong direction, and I could handle it relatively fine, but the loaders and whatnot would be a problem. Remember this isn't a race, every fight is a marathon. It's why even Salvador's passive healing is one of the most important skills in my current build. Sure, it's a half percent per second, but when fights last as long as they do, I need to survive with no other sources of healing. Again, sustainability is the name of the game, and when working harder won't help, working smarter is the way to go. This pipe is great as a general skip for a number of things, but it also works as cover against pretty much everything coming your way. The nukes can be an issue, but I mean, I can use a gun this time. It, it, it's fine. And as low level as it is, these turrets are fully manageable with non torg endorsed merch. Part of me is surprised we haven't seen him more upset about these things existing in the later installments, but I suppose that would require Gearbox paying attention to the problem. And I know that it doesn't make sense for them to come back to the game after this long to fix such a niche issue, but... Gearbox, could you please patch this one part of the game? Just the one. How long could it possibly take you? We're begging you here! And I sat around and waited for the badass version to break itself because I'm pretty confident that this was the fastest route to go about things anyway. I wanted to see about how long it'd take for that to happen by itself. I did forget and shoot it several times, but let's be real, it probably didn't change the time required too much. For the record, it was 17 minutes, 43 seconds from the time that it landed to the time that it dealt its own final blow. Then on to the other turrets. These ones aren't as bad, but imagine something sort of like this and then multiply it by a total of 12 of these things that you need to break and you probably have an all right idea as to how this went. Don't you love armor resisting non-elemental bullets? Then came time to fight the bunker. And honestly, this could have gone a lot worse. Didn't have to deal with anything like dying and having a legitimate ranged option meant I could sort of just hang out wherever I felt like, slowly peppering it with bullets. I think I managed to fire enough to clog something because I have no idea how else this would have solved any issues. And after two hours of continuous fire, the bunker would be no more. Of course, that wouldn't be the end of this little excursion. Next up would be Angel Core, and it would only take me 15 minutes to kill an Ion Loader. It took me 15 minutes to kill an Ion Loader. I just want you to know that a single Ion Loader, a basic enemy that you encounter throughout the game, took me longer to kill 
than it took for me to kill Bloodwing. I was fighting in here against just a few bots and some flimsy turrets for entirely too long. It took three hours just for Roland to show up. Why did he get to take the cliffs? Why send me and my pea shooter to confront all of Hyperion's army to sneak a single soldier into the same location? Why couldn't we have both taken the stealth approach? He clearly wasn't intent on actually helping because it took him over another hour until he started contributing to the conflict. Once he did, things started going considerably faster. And Lilith was here too. She was genuinely helpful. Even though she can't damage war or badass loaders, she was able to draw some of their fire with her face. By all technicality, I knew this place would be the end of the run though, for the most purest among us, as this place is almost guaranteed to break, spending as long as I did. One of the pipes became invulnerable to most forms of damage, so I used a stock grenade because you can't make me go through that again, only for it to break a second time. So two stock grenade throws are required to break environmental damage in the run. Because I sure as heck ain't gonna beat this any meaningfully faster. After a total of five hours and 54 minutes just in Angel Core, I was finally free of this god-awful place. I guess the best man really was chosen for stealth, though, because I couldn't find Roland after leaving the place. Mordecai had a good idea. Last time I tried to find Roland, I found Lilith. So if I find her, maybe I'll be able to find him again. It's a long shot, but it's the only shot I've got. As long as you exclude the literal thousands of shots that I've fired and also have yet to fire. I thought it'd be good to start looking for her in Iridium Blight, but they insisted that I search in Sawtooth Cauldron. This, of course, would begin with the incredibly long and slow process of tickling the ambush commanders into admitting that they're just as confused as I am as to why I'm here. Luckily, the elevator shaft is incredibly safe. After defeating them, I... Oh. Oh no. That's not good. That's not good at all. Luckily, Boombringer's health doesn't seem to recover, and I was even able to get one of the locals to help in distracting other folks around in these parts, long enough to take a few good shots of the big ol' bird. Also, apparently the game doesn't require you to be alive to be considered a badass. Next up, of course, was some buzzard busting. I couldn't see this going well, but my whole plan more or less hinged on getting a goliath to kill everything for me, and goliath helmets have way too much health to be reliable up here. After being used as a human projectile, I reloaded the area and changed directions. I don't know why I never thought about it, but this area over here by the quest giver goliath is fairly safe for general aggro. Some enemies will wander over here, but by hopping up into here, everything will sort of just leave you alone. Which works out kind of perfectly for slowly shooting down the buzzards one by one because this is not a fast fight by any definition, though they do fly relatively close. I managed to get really lucky at the end with two of them getting stuck to each other, held almost perfectly still to bring both down in the only double kill that I've had in the last many, many hours of gameplay. I kept searching in some other place. Had to do some mild valve work, which was as easy as always, and I moved on to find a map to Lilith, which was as easy as always. But why do they have this? I headed back to where I wanted to search the first time and began desperately to try to open a door. The loaders weren't all that threatening. I could survive them just fine, at least. I did try to do some tricky stuff with luring King Mong into hitting enemies for me, which came with some extremely mixed success. Realistically, it was easiest to break the surveyors by sitting under them to break their AI, then just shooting the loaders a lot from outside of where they can wander. While some encounters were long but complicated, this one was mostly just long. Really long. But the bright side would be quite bright indeed, for after this nightmare came my knight in shining biceps. Brick, you beautiful bastard. It's good to see you. Also, hi, Mordecai. It's kind of funny in the sense that the big climactic battle to get to the final boss is genuinely one of the most comfortable parts of any given run that I do. Or it would be had I not messed up. I was so close, but dying here meant that enemies had spawned in, including the constructor at the end of the area. And worse, while panicking, I accidentally bounced on a warloader, which meant reloading the map. The map that no longer had my friend. Or Mordecai. Believe it or not though, I genuinely had an easy time getting back and managed to get through on my first attempt upon reloading the map because, of course, just had to scare the hell out of me first. Handsome Jack would be quite the trial though. He functions quite similarly to his body double and he's considerably harder to kill than said double. His shield takes a ton of rounds, which are at least easy to pump into him by lodging myself into a safe spot on the map. He's really not dangerous, so phase one is easy. Unless... Hijack ass. You get hijack assed. I hate when that happens. Phase 2 spawns in a bunch of enemies that I can't really kill quickly enough for it to matter. Enemies respawn every 25 minutes, so clearing the area isn't really an option. I tried quite unsuccessfully to break him via blocking him from the terminal. His digiclones are dangerous during this phase, and the, the melee ones can push you away from the terminal. The ranged ones do a lot of damage, so... When all else fails though, so too does Jack's AI. 
It'd be embarrassing if it wasn't so expected. He managed to break far from where most of the other enemies will even bother to venture, so it really was just a question of how many rounds I could put into him, and given that I have a Horticlass mod available and an ammo spawner directly next to me, the answer is however many rounds it takes. I just... I, I can't even with this game sometimes. And of course that means that the only hurdle left is the warrior, an allegedly great alien power that never canonically did anything impressive on screen. And I'm here today to prove that it's an impressive. See, the game doesn't share health values with you. According to the internet though, this fella has around 207,000 health. Each of my shots to its body deals 3 damage. Shots to its weak points deal 5 damage. I can't deal enough damage to expose crit spots, otherwise shots to its tiny mouth deal 10 damage. It was so bad that this guy was just ignoring the laws of physics with its breakdancing. Luckily this place is incredibly safe, so I was able to slowly chip away at its health, with a gun that's closer to a suggestion than it is a weapon. And you may be wondering, how long did this take? Well, while this wasn't the most intense fight in the world, nor the most complex, it did require my attention to properly aim to prevent it from taking as long as it could have. And it required my attention for six hours straight. Six hours of just this. I would once again like to remind you that this is a single fire weapon that fires two bullets while aimed in. But still, you have to pull the finger for each instance of firing this pint-sized piece of fury. It is relentless. It is unending. Thousands of rounds as I turned Borderlands into something closer to a clicker game than a shooter, but I'll say again, the warrior never did anything impressive. After all, like everything else that came before it, it died to the basic repeater. My first gun. My only gun. And the only one you need to beat Borderlands 2. As long as you've got a spare 47-ish hours laying around. It's so powerful, in fact, that it even has the power to one-shot Handsome Jack. Where the hell were you guys five minutes ago? If it weren't for the Vault Hunter, we'd all be dead. Five minutes? Try five hours! Seriously, you had six hours to catch up with me. But I've located Lilith, so now it's only a matter of time until I find Roland. Maybe in a sequel or something. Dude's crazy good at hiding. Anyways, while I get looking for him, I'd like to thank my lovely channel members. Your kindness is greatly appreciated. Regardless of who you are, though, I hope you enjoyed your time here. You probably know how to use social media, and I hope that means I'll get to hear your thoughts now and on any future outings. Until then, remember to stay safe, spread some kindness in the world, and I hope that you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.